Hello, everybody out there. Um, today's webinar, we're going to be talking about how to create content that produces instant leads and sales. Um, and before we get into the webinar, what I'd like to do is really introduce our super exciting guests that we have here today. Um, we've got three content marketing experts that are on our panel. Um, the first person I'd like to introduce is Michael Brenner. And uh, Michael is the head of strategy for NewsCred. Um, which, if you don't know what NewsCred is, it's one of the best content marketing platforms out there. Uh, Michael's also the author of a B2B, a B2B Marketing Insider blog, and he's a frequent contributor to leading publications like Forbes, uh, The Economist, The Guardian, the, uh, the Entrepreneur, and he regularly writes on content marketing. Um, second, we've got here in the middle, which is Stephanie, uh, Stephanie Miller, and Stephanie is a partner of Top Right Partners, um, which is a brand and marketing strategy agency. Um, she's uh, says that she's a relentless customer advocate and a champion for marketers creating memorable customer experiences. Stephanie also speaks and writes regularly and revered, at, revered as a content marketing expert too. And then Marsha uh, Wright for Johnson, um, she's the author of Word Up, and uh, you can say that again. Um, she serves as a managing uh, editor and content mar on the Content Marketing Institute's Intelligent Content Blog. And she says, she'd say this, she says she's, she has run a technical writing business for a long time. Um, she's definitely one of the leading authorities on writing and, and content marketing. And then we'd also like to introduce the people behind the scenes today too, and without these, these people working, we wouldn't have this um, awesome webinar that's taking place. That is, uh, there's myself, uh, I'm the Chief Operations Officer at Powered by Search, but then really the, the people who are driving this webinar every single month we give them a round of applause virtually, which is Joel, Gordon, and Dwayne for their hard work um, about this. Next, we're going to do a little bit of cleaning house. Let's just talk about when you can see this webinar, just in case um, you are, are, have to jump off or it's not a good connection. We do want to let you know that we are recording it. Um, it should be available around August 3rd on our blog, um, or you can go to Fire Search 2015 webinar series. Um, we're also, if you signed up for it and you didn't sign up, also if you signed up for it, we'll also send you a link to the recording of the webinar so that you can rewatch it again or send it to your friends um, and peers. Um, next up, we're going to actually start, you know, if you're on Twitter, um, we'd also like you to use the hashtag uh, Marketing Fanatics uh, because we're fanatics about marketing. Uh, let's get right into asking our panel some questions. So I think I'm going to start with just directing it over to you, Michael, since you were the first one we introduced. Um, I think I see yourself on mute, so when you get a chance, you can unmute yourself. And I'm going to ask you this first question here, which is, you know, how can we make content stand out and uh, compete against clickbait? Maybe before you get into competing against clickbait, maybe for those out there, because I think we have people at different levels of knowledge, they may not understand what clickbait is. So maybe tell us what clickbait is, and then maybe you can tell us how we can stand out and compete against it. Sure, I can. This is Stephanie. I can. I can try to to do that. So I think Michael was trying to to make a joke about princesses, but it's um, you know, clickbait is any sort of um, hype or or uh, uh, content that you create that's intended to get a click, but then it's kind of a bait and switch. So you get to the actual content, and it's not what you thought it would be. So you know, I think there are some uh, some sites that actually use hype in their headlines very successfully. So like Buzzfeed comes to mind, right? Like there's they are really, really good at writing headlines, right? So, so it always kind of brings um, brings you in. But then the reason why that's not clickbait is because you get there and the article is exactly what they said it was going to be. They're just really good at writing the headlines. So, I think, you know, I had this conversation with a client this morning. Is that, you know, she feels compelled to exaggerate in her headlines because the content that she has, she doesn't think it's going to be relevant or that interesting to her audience. But really, what her problem is is not that whether she should use clickbait or not. She needs different content, right? So if you, I think, if, as a marketer, if you feel the need to exaggerate and and misrepresent your content in order to get clicks, there's something wrong with your your content, right? So you know, clickbait is a little bit like smoking. It's it's a very unhealthy choice for a content marketer, and ultimately will be disastrous and hazardous to your to your long term health. Marsha, would you have a would you have something to add there? Yeah, I I think you said it really well about what clickbait is and why you don't want to do it. And I in fact think of an example. I'm going to tell a story on myself. <laughs> this isn't exactly clickbait, but it's it's to me in the same category. 
if you're putting clickbait out there, what you're doing is you're thinking, me, me, me. Look at me, look at me. You're waving your arms. You are trying to get attention to yourself. Your focus is not on your audience and what they need. And uh, so the story I'm going to tell myself is that I fell into a trap kind of like that with that mentality that uh, I want to get your attention because I have something I want to sell you and not about what you need. So I had a book a couple of years ago, fresh out on the market, and if you have ever put a book out there, you may relate to this, that all you're thinking about every time you meet somebody is, this person wants my book. I just need to tell them about it, and they're going to want it. And I did that on Twitter with someone I didn't know. I kind of roped her in and very quickly jumped and pounced on her and said, oh, I have a book you're going to want. And she sent me a message uh, that, uh, am I still on? I yep. see a symbol. Okay, great. Uh, she sent me a message that I took a screenshot of. It, it really brought me back down to earth and reminded me, as communicators, as content marketers, what we're there for is not about selling our thing. She, this was her message to me. Don't hound me with self-promotion. You know, does that not just put a stake right in your heart? She says, instead, here were the words of wisdom that I keep in front of me. Contribute to the community and people will seek you. So if you have your heart in contributing to the community, putting content out there that people are going to value, then you don't need to worry about competing with clickbait. People will seek you. Yeah. I, th I think that's really sound advice. I mean, we're, we're in such a stage where it's consultative selling and they're going to get the information anyways, and we want to buy from people we trust. And if they're getting really great information to begin with, they're going to go, holy crap, this is what I'm getting for free. Imagine what I'm going to get when I actually pay for it or mm -hmm. purchase the product or the book or something like that. What, what great advice that was. That was fantastic. Um, I want to move on to the next question, though. And, and, and Michael, I just before we do, I want to test to make sure that you can hear us okay and you have no echo. Michael, how, how, how is it going? I'm back, and I apologize. No echo, so we're all good. Good to go. Awesome. Okay, good. Um, so the next question is... Um, what is and, and this is certainly and this I think this is a bit of a loaded question, but and maybe we can each of you get the, to answer this. And what is the number one content marketing tip everyone should follow? And I'm like, wow, is there really one? But uh, let's 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 hear what your number one content marketing tip would be that that you believe that people should follow. And we can start over with with Stephanie. I think let's start with Stephanie. Sure. So it's hard as you as you recognize, Matt. It's hard to pick just one, but I, I would say that the number one thing is that it's not about quantity. Right, it's about quality, and I think if we all, as content marketers, sort of you know exercise the muscle that get us as relevant as possible mm -hmm. to the audience that we're trying to reach, then we will get you know qu quantity of results without the excess quantity of content. I mean, the world doesn't need more stuff; we need more things that we're interested in. Right. So, so really, instead of publishing like. 20 posts a day, you recommend you know posting one good one per week or something like that. Well, I, I don't know what the number is. I think ah. if 20 posts a week is what your your audience's tolerance is, go for it, right? Like if that's going to help create the demand and, and the relationship, then you should do that. I don't think there's a hard and fast number. I just think that you shouldn't aim for 20 just to get 20. You should right. only aim for 20 if 20 makes sense for you. Yeah. That makes sense. How about you, Michael? Now we got you back. What's what would be your number one content marketing tip? So I, you know, and I absolutely agree with Stephanie, but I'm going to disagree with her. Um, so the uh, here, and here's what I'm going to say: it's not that she's wrong. I think that um, my number one marketing tip to answer content marketing tip to answer your question directly, and then I'll tell you what I meant by my disagreement. Um, my number one tip is answer your customers' questions. I think I think content marketing is as simple as answering your target prospect or customers' questions. And I think um, one of the things that we talk to our customers about is that, you know, publishers don't wake up. Like I talk about CNN. CNN doesn't wake up to, and say, you know what, there's not a lot going on in Europe today, so we're not going to publish anything about Europe. Publishers publish every single day. So what I would say is that Stephanie's not wrong in saying that quantity isn't as important in, as quality. I think quality is, is the bar. Um, but one good piece a year will make no impact in this world. And so if we follow, as content marketers, the publisher model, publishers publish every day. And this, I think the challenge for brands especially 
isn't – first of all, I'm not saying we should publish low quality. I'm, I would never say that. What I'm saying is that I, we need to commit to publishing a high quantity of high quality stuff. That's what publishers do. That's why they're successful at attracting an audience, um, and that's what I think brands need to do to be effective content marketers. I, I, I like that. How, how, how about you, Marsha? I'm going to say something that builds on uh, Stephanie and Michael's comments, and I'm quoting Joe Polizzi, if you follow the Content Marketing Institute, for whom I do some work, by the way, full disclosure, I think that was said at the beginning, Joe says over and over, you hardly could miss this if you listen to anything he says, build a subscriber base. Mm -hmm. So that goes with the publisher model that Michael was just talking about. If you're building a subscriber base as your primary goal, so the number one content marketing tip, you can sell them anything. That's the philosophy that uh, CMI has followed. It took them three years to become profitable, and they just kept putting the content out there, kept building their subscriber base, and look at them now. Right. I assume that your audience is familiar with uh, the CMI success story. And if you're not, it's easy to find. That's cool. So, I mean, I've, what I've heard is quality is important from Stephanie. Michael's talked about answer your audience's questions. And then you've talked about that, you know, build an audience, build a subscriber base, build a mm -hmm. following of, of loyal fans is, 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 the, is the trick. I think those are great, great, great tips. Um, there's another question here that we have. We're going to go to the next one, and this is an interesting one. I actually find it really interesting, particularly when it's involving around sales copy, but um, it applies to content marketing too. And I guess, you know, and I know that I know that there's no real answer to this, but let's get some debating going on with it. Is long form content really better than short form content? Who, who would like to take the lead on that one? Well, I'm the first last time, so I. Can, oh, go ahead, Michael. No, you. I'm going to give it up to you. <laughs> so thank you. So um, I think the question should really be better for what, right? So, so it, it, you know, I hate it when the answer in marketing is it depends, but I think long-form content can be great for many, many situations, particularly B2B and particularly later in the uh, life cycle, but is long-form content always better than short-form? No, of course not. So go ahead, Michael. That's It's all you now. I completely agree. I think um, one of the things I think is important is to understand is that if you want to rank for search, you almost have to um, commit to long form. I think the average, I, th I think I saw a study by Fast Company that the average um, article that ranks in the top five has something like 1,800 to 2,400 words. So that's a pretty long piece of content um, if you want to rank for search. I don't think all content marketing should just be about ranking for search. So there are times when list posts and clickbait I think sometimes can be important as well. Right. I think it really depends on the goal of the content, right? What do you want readers and people to do after going through it? But yeah. Mm -hmm. Marsha, so you I, you got I, I can see it. You're thinking. You got the finger on your chin. <laughs> I think that this whole discussion goes goes way back before the internet, of course, and David Ogilvy, famous mm -hmm. ad man. Yes. Is widely quoted as as having researched this question and I mean who knows what really what constitutes short and what it long means those are hard even to pin down but his research found that long copy sells better than short so if you've done your targeting and you're talking to the right people who are really interested in what you have to say and you're giving them valuable information they're gonna read it and you may end up selling more so I think we too often hear the advice of keep it short, as if uh, I, I think it shortchanges readers if we do that. Really, I agree. I hate to agree because we got to get a debate going here, but I do agree with Michael and Stephanie. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I'm going to end with a quotation, and then and then I'll bounce it back to you, Michael. I think one of the things that's go ahead. Uh, this is from a supposedly Winston Churchill, like just about every other quote in the world. So who knows if he really said it, but it goes like this. A good speech, and I would say any text that we write, should be like a woman's skirt. Mm -hmm. Long enough to cover the subject mm -hmm. and short enough to create interest. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <Wow>. Very true. <laughs> 
I don't even know if I could follow that. I, I mean, I was going to say that um, I think Ogilvy <laughs> contradicted himself a little bit with that with that in initial research you mentioned, in that he said that you know when you when you uh, when you write your headline, you've spent eighty percent or eighty cents of your dollar. So it's a you know it's a little bit of uh, you know you have to kind of balance. I think how, the lead you know don't bury the lead with um, give them the, give the best answer and the most in depth answer you can. I think it's it's you got to balance it. Now, Michael, just you know, before you go on again, and this is just because we have different levels of understanding that there, not everybody would know what burying the lead means. Can you maybe just explain that for people out there that don't understand what a lead is? Yeah, so I it, I think that that quote goes to newspaper beat writers, and uh, an editor would often give him that advice. And and what that means is that the main point of the story shouldn't be six paragraphs in. Um, in fact, we I think the way that uh, you know, publishers train their or journalists get trained is that um, you know if you're going to focus on one thing, focus on your title. If you're going to focus on on two things, focus on your title and your first sentence. And if you're going to focus on three things, focus on your title, your first sentence, and then the whole first paragraph. And that's the point: is you, the the lead should not be certainly any further than that first line or first paragraph. Right. And how do you guys feel about that? You know, you know, that's a journalist thing. Do you believe that that directly corresponds to marketing on the web today that you know it's headline and then your first sentence really needs to be the lead in that format works best even for web marketing I would this is Stephanie I would again say yes or no right I mean I think that you know storytelling is really powerful mm -hmm. and so you wanna you wanna be able to tell your story and so mm -hmm. yes the headline has to tell you know kinda get the person engaged and sort of you know at least posit a question or start to in, um, in, invite them into an experience um, but you know, I think that you know, always having the, the the core message and the only you know real call to action in the first paragraph that creates a construct that I think is too is too mm -hmm. limiting, right? So you have to kind of know your you have to know your audience, right? And so you know, we work with customers where it's really important to you know say what you're going to say in the first paragraph and no fluff, and then you can do your storytelling. And other audiences where you can kind of be woven into a story and it takes a much longer time and the lead does get buried but it's a storytelling technique and it works. Right. Cool. Let's move on to the next question um, which is how do I can this is this is really interesting too I think and this is a this is a fair question I think exists today on the web you know there's so much content out there and, and you know how much are we actually reading it so I guess how do we convert visitors into customers when a lot of our, our customers or, or people reading the content are just skimming it. Is there some ways that you found or techniques and strategies that, that you find have been able to improve conversions from content marketing? We'll start again with Stephanie and move our way over. Stephanie. I get what to go first. So, um, so I, was, I was looking up for some stats and stuff like that and I found that um, it is true. It is true that readers vanish long before our copy is, is finished. Uh, about 40% drop after the headline. Another 10% never scroll, right? So if it's not above the fold, whatever that is on your screen, um, you know, they don't, they don't see it. Um, and, you know, I, as someone who, who writes a lot and I do a lot of columns and stuff, I, I've sort of long suspected that people don't scroll because what happens is people put comments about something that was later in the article and, you know, they didn't get that far, so that's why they thought that mm. it wasn't addressed, right? So, so we see that all the time as content producers. But my main, my main thing here is when you think about scannable content and, oh, gosh, you know, like, how do we, how do we deal with it? I feel a little bit like get over it. Like, all web content is, must be scannable and it must be easily digested by people who are super busy. So there's lots of things you can do to make your content more appealing from an eye standpoint. So, you know, bullet points, the way you use subheads, um, you know, the, the, the white space that you use, using like one sentence paragraphs every once in a while to kind of get main points across. You know, there's a lot of things you can do that make your content a lot more uh, skimmable and, and scannable so that people actually walk away with the takeaways without having read the whole, the whole bit. I think you just have to accept it that most people won't. Right. And do you guys, how, how, how important is it when you're producing content, do you find that it, it must be visually pleasing? Like, how, how often are you finding that, that images um, and, or, and other aspects, you know, especially with social sharing being so photo-driven today, as being an important part to creating content just as much as the written material? Do you, like, what percentage are you spending on writing it 
versus making it visually pleasing. I don't know if I have an exact number in terms of percentage, but I would say that there's definitely like 25% is the presentation of it. So, you know, my process is that I focus on writing it and then I go back and sort of, you know, reformat it. But, you know, there might be other people who do it differently. But you always have that in your mind. And the more you write for certain contexts and for certain audiences, I think that you start doing it right from the get-go because you just know your audience better. Yeah. Marsha, what, what, what you guys, do you spend a lot of time making your content visually pleasing or does it not even matter to you? Oh, who cares about what it looks like? <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to jump in with something shocking that I learned from Jerry McGovern. Ooh, okay. there, how's that for clickbait? Shocking. <laughs> but it really did shock me. He, he gave this talk at Confab. And he said that, uh, I think it was a university that he was working with, and they looked at their analytics and they discovered that when they used uh, uh, generic images or stock photos, they actually got less engagement. They had less lower conversion levels. So the stock photos were turning people off. They were becoming kind of part of that whole banner blindness syndrome. So, and I heard several other speakers at Confab as well saying, take your own photos for goodness sake. Don't ever use generic images. So that's one really great and pretty easy tip. That is shocking. That is shocking. Yes, yay. Thank you, Stephanie. My goal is accomplished. My work here is done. <laughs> shocking. I want to add one thing to my your original question about uh, converting customers when all they do is skim, and we are all that customer. Every every one of us, we skim everything we read. We're just we're picking, we're cherry picking, and so I think the best way to take advantage of that is to produce everything, knowing your reader is going to cherry pick it, and these are the things that you pay most attention to. Of course, we talked about title and opening paragraph. I put right up there next in importance is figure captions. People who read nothing else are going to look at the pictures, they're going to read every word of the caption, and I write my captions as though people are going to read nothing else. Mm -hmm. And in fact, often I'm sure that they won't. So I pack those captions so that every important bit of information is in there, and if that's all they read, they get everything. Mm -hmm. And then the I think that's good. Oops. I'm sorry, Marcia. I think it's good advice to going back and checking and making sure, like after you write it, that you if you just skimmed the one par the one sentence paragraphs, the captions, the subheads, am I getting the message? Right. So that's always a good test, I think. But captions is a good is a good point. I agree on that. That's a great point. So you go back and read your headlines or or standout pieces, and then does it still tell the full story that you're trying to communicate? If the answer is no, then you might have more work that you need to do. Is that's basically what you're communicating? I, I think that's that's really neat. That's a that's a great tip. And the easy thing there is to just simply copy those key bits from your body copy into your captions. Don't worry about the fact that you're repeating them. People are probably never going to read it in the body copy. Right. So just go ahead and grab those pieces you want to make sure they see. You don't have to put a lot of extra time in on those captions. Yeah. Now, along the lines of conversions, though, guys, how many of you are actually trying to take content and turn it into conversions, like bottom of funnel type stuff versus, you know, educational type stuff that might be middle or top of funnel? Are you finding that you're writing a lot of bottom of funnel type content? Yeah, that's. I wanted to get back to the original question. I mean, I think the the fact that we have skimmable, we're a skimmable user, uh, you know, audience, all of us, I think is important. It means we have to be good at writing list posts uh, and skimmable content. I think that's where we just sort of went. One of the things, though, that I think is important is that you want to master that because that's where people in the early stages are focusing, right? They're looking for the top X to, to, to do, or they're looking at the eight best practices to follow, or they're looking for the five blog posts that they might want to read later. Um, one of the things, I, I'll go back to Marsha's, I think, well, at least for me, opening comment, <laughs> um, a focus on subscribers. When I was at SAP, we, I spent a whole year getting this question wrong. We put click to call, click to chat, contact a salesperson, download this white paper. We put 
offers and calls to action all over our content marketing efforts, mm -hmm. and and very few of our readers were subscribe were, were sort of converting. Then we introduced a focus on these subscriptions, and and we started creating and optimizing into content that drove subscribers, um, and not because we loved having subscribers, but what we found was that when we created content that drove subscribers, um, we were better at writing that early stage content. The subscribers then converted, and so. By converted, I mean they downloaded those white papers, they clicked a call to a salesperson, they registered for events that we were we were um, conducting over the course of the year. Um, and so the point was, when we focused on conversions directly, we were completely unsuccessful. When we focused on creating great content that people were able to skim, allowing them to, su to subscribe and using subscriptions as the key measure of success of our content, then those subscribers converted. It's kind of like a little counterintuitive, but that's what we learned. Right, and I think that's that leads us to another good question. You know, besides asking people to subscribe, what other you know CTAs or yeah, have you found that work for, for for content? Have any of you found some tips or tricks that other people can employ, or besides Michael's? So I, I'm, go ahead, Marcia. The the thing that comes to mind is don't put it in a box. It will look like a banner. People won't even see it. Mm -hmm. Don't put it in a box, okay? To make it look like a banner, basically, is the message thing. How about you, Stephanie? Yeah, I was just gonna say, share, sharing is a big one in terms of metrics, right? It's 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 something that's trackable, and so I think that's a that's a common uh, metric that people that people aim for. Mm -hmm. And so, if you want your content to be shared, you have to make it easy to share it, right? So so the sharing buttons need to be pre-formatted. They need to be visible. Uh, there needs to be a very clear way to leave comments. Um, you know, you need to, you know, kind of make that make that part of it. And then I think sharing what is shared, like yeah. going all that way to kind of engage people into a community, uh, we find that, you know, those people then become much more engaged with future content, but also with the brand itself. So, um, you know, there's nothing better than having your customers or your community um, do the messaging for you, right? Like they start talking the way that you talk about your story. And that's, that's I find, um, you know, something that's it's so refreshing when that starts to happen, and you sort of hit that hit that tipping point where your community can can kind of sort of speak the same language as your brand. And spread the word as being a goal. So that could be a good good a good goal to have is just getting viability of your your content through different the, the audience. Yeah. Well, one thing we do that's kind of you know maybe it's a little sneaky, but we do it anyways, and it works. So um, so I encourage you to use it too. Is we make it incomplete. So we say, hey, here's ten things for your checklist or everything you do. However, there's really five more things that are even better, and you can get it if you download it here at the end. So, so they're engaged with the content, they got value, but there was really, you know, five pieces that was missing to be able to get it. And I found that sometimes works well too, if, if the first part of the content was good. Yeah, Matthew, I just read another tip that I want to employ. I haven't done it yet, but I just read about it. I think it's brilliant. Um, it's uh, a le like create a button at the bottom of every article you write that says uh, click here to download a PDF so you can email it. Yeah, lead pages have been doing that for a long time. Very effective. It's That's a nice. great idea. I can't believe I haven't done it yet, but it's you know it's a great way to just capture email address. It's not specific specifically a subscription, but it's a great way to capture your email address and it just it follows our user flow, right? Yeah. A lot of times we read an article, we want to email it to somebody. It does, we don't, you know, maybe we don't have internet access or they don't, and you know, it's just. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, lead pages swears by it, and they actually do it in what's called a lead box, so that it kind of pulls up right away and that as a like kind of a light box, and that you can get it. And they and they a couple other steps. They make it in a two-step process a lot of times too, so that it's a, a click now, and then you, they realize they have to enter the email address because they discovered that if they put the email address first. Um, they, they actually get less opt-ins, but if they're halfway committed to clicking on the button first, ah, fuck, I clicked on the button, I might as well continue the rest of the way is kind of the, the theory or the thinking of it. You know, I, again, I think it's one of the things you have to test for your content and your goals, but another great, great tip to getting people into the funnel, because at the end of the day, that's what we're writing content for, is to get people into our marketing funnel, to build trust with them so that we can have something to, to sell, I think, or at least that's why I do it. Mm -hmm. I like selling stuff. <laughs> Um, let's go on to another question. So this is about marketing mistakes, and I love this one because you see all these blunders that happen out there. But what are some of the common content, you know, content marketing mistakes that you see that are happening and other people should avoid? Like, you know, just don't do this. Like, this sucks, and and, and you suck as a content marketer if you do this. 
tell us some of those things. We'll start again. How about we start, uh, Mar uh, how about we start the other end uh, this time around? And we start with you, Marcia. I would love to. So I would say the top content marketing mistake is giving up too soon. Mm, great, and great tip. You give up too soon if your expectations are unrealistic. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm going to quote Joe Polizzi, and this is one of the things he's going to talk about a lot in the book that comes out in September. I don't know how he keeps pumping out the books, but the new one is called Content Inc. And uh, he talks about the model there for content-based businesses. He interviews, the book is full of interviews with companies who follow this model. Mm -hmm. and the big thing he says, the ingredient that content marketers are missing over and over is patience. Mm. He says it takes at least a year, so the research and these companies bear this out, mm. 12 to 17 months of putting the content out there, putting the content out there, putting the content out there, before you can even start to think about monetizing. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Oh, I also saw some reports like that, that reinforce that too, some studies that was taken across 10 or 12 different industries where they produce content, but over a long period of time, if they stay consistent with it, uh, it was after a year, I think it was around between 14 and 18 months, um, that it was that content marketing leads end up being less than they're comparing it to pay-per-click, as in search engine leads, where people are directly looking to solve a problem. That It was more cost-effective at that point once they built up an audience and were doing it consistently enough. So I'm a, I'm a big believer in that, that people give up too soon. They don't realize the real effort and the long-term vision it takes to make it profitable for their business, and, and they really just need to stick with it. Even just building a big enough audience and pipeline, um, you need to just do it longer. Like two, two years wouldn't be an unrealistic um, timeline to think about before it starts becoming super profitable. Mm -hmm. How about uh, Michael? How about Michael? You're up for you as well. You know what? What's one of the biggest mistakes or you know pitfalls or things that people do with their content marketing that they should avoid? Yeah. So I think Marsha's answer is absolutely right when it comes to content marketers. Um, unfortunately, there's very few of us out there, and I think um, when you talk about what's the biggest content marketing mistake that all marketers are making, mm -hmm. um, I think by far the answer is that it's just selfish promotion. Mm -hmm. um, I even talk about uh, when I do presentations about what I call the unique point of view trap, and I've I've seen this where there's you know there's sort of a um, a skeptic, you know, a marketing executive uh, who's got his you know his, his arms are folded, and he sits back and you know right after he ans asks the content marketing ROI question, he says, well everybody's creating content, um, we really need to put forth our unique point of view. And I love that. I love that sort of objection. And it's not that I don't think unique points of view are important. Um, at some late stage in the buying process, like at some point, you got to tell somebody that, you know, your competitor is higher priced or lower quality, right? At some point, you got to make that that statement. Joe Polizzi makes the point that everybody can can copy your 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 competitive advantage. The way to be unique is to be the most helpful with your content. And so, unique points of view have become so much less important. And that's, I guess, maybe a little bit against the uh, content, uh, sort of the marketing training that many of us received back in college, if we got any. Um, but, you know, especially with product marketers, I call it insidious, right? They'll say they're going to write a helpful piece of content, but, you know, by the second paragraph, they're already talking about the product. And, and I think, you know, I've spent so much time trying to, to really talk about this cultural shift towards being customer-centric, to really, really, like, meaning to care and to help your customers and not just faking it, um, I think that's the biggest mistake that marketers make when it comes to content marketing. Right, they get too promotional too soon without adding enough value over a long period of time and that trust, yeah. Good tips. Stephanie, how about, you, you got one where people are, you see them just make sure. that epic fail? Yeah, I think, um, well, I just want to build off of what Michael was saying, too, is that, you know, I think it's sort of like, you know, activity versus audience, right? Like, if you're just producing stuff that's, um, you know, about yourself as opposed to things that are really about your audience, I think that can be a, a, a very common trap. Um, mm -hmm. I love the program that uh, Hilton did over Twitter, and it's, it's, it's um, I had to go look it up. I'm, here I'm mentioning it. I'm not sure the, the handle, but it's, uh, it's like at Hilton Help or, or at Local Help or something like that. And so if you are somebody tweeting, hey, I'm at the such and such hotel in New York City, and I wonder if there's any good restaurants near here, um, the 
the people who man that, that handle, who are employees of Hilton, will answer, even if you're not staying at a Hilton hotel. And mm -hmm. there is no mention. They, they do. They have good discipline. They do not say, oh, next time you're in New York, there's a Hilton, yeah. you know, right down the street from where you are. And they just be helpful. And so they have employees. The handle is Hilton, right? So you would know who it was at the end of the day. Well, it's, it's, but this is like, it's not the official Hilton handle. It's like ah. at Hilton Help or something like that, or at Local Help. So I'll look it up. But anyway, so it's, but it's great. And they, they do, they do refrain from doing product promotions. They really do just help people. Help people. And I think that, you know, what, what they did is they started it as a test market um, in the South. And they said, look, if anybody is, any employee is actually doing this anyway, which people were, use this handle to do it and just help people out. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll support you in that, you know. So, um, so they have employees who are basically doing it on their own time. And there's no, like, formal training or anything. It's just people who live there and they know hospitality and they're being helpful. So I think that it's kind of like two things. One is that, you know, to um, uh, Michael's point about, you know, be helpful. Your content needs to be helpful and serve your customer. But the other piece, I think, is, a, is the trap that um, we haven't talked about is utilizing your employees and not, and not forgetting about them, right? So they can be an, an enormous bank of opportunity for most organizations, especially B2B. They are smart about the product. They travel in the circle. They're active on social media in a lot of cases. And so you need to do it in a way that doesn't force it, right? It has to be appropriate to your culture, and you have to make sure that your employees are going to do it in a way that's that they embrace and they don't get passive aggressive about it, you know, like, oh, they're making me do this, so I'm just going to be a jerk, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure it's done well. But but I think employees is, a, is an asset that most content marketers have that is often not taken advantage of. Yeah, I think that's that's really true. And I, I'd like to expand off a couple things that you brought up there with the panel here because I thought they were really good points. Um, two, two things I would love to expand on with the other panels as well is you, know, you, you gave this great example, and there's nothing like a good example of a, a content marketing um, a story. I'd like to hear a couple of those from other people as well as, you know, what are some other ideas that you can get, you know, on how you can get your employees involved with helping you create content and like you said, without it making it a, a chore, you know. I know we tried one before in our organization and it was a, it was kind of a, it was a little, it ended up being a bit of a fail at the end of the day. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you about it anyways. We tried to do what's called a blogging contest where we pay a thousand dollars for the best blog created by our, our team and agency and, 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 and but the problem was what we did and why it failed was it wasn't it wasn't optional. We made it mandatory and like you said it backfired in our face that after two or three months it didn't work. But you would think that, oh giving a thousand dollars away to one person on your team for writing the best blog post um, would be a great incentive and you get maybe lots of blog posts to be able to put up, but it didn't quite work. So I didn't think we thought it through as well as some of the others. So I'd love to hear from you guys if you found other great ways that other businesses can leverage and encourage their employees to help create content. Yeah, I, I mean, this I could go on on this topic forever, and um, you know, part of the the reason is I the the blog that I built at SAP Business Innovation, which they just they just sort of rebranded and and are extending it now into print. I think it's an amazing um, example of content marketing, but. I started with no budget, and the only way to do content without a budget is with volunteer contributors. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I made the same mistake, Matthew. I went to, you know, we tried to do contests and tried to uh, encourage people to do stuff. What we found is that where there was an interest, and so for example, I started, I, w I reached out to 12 existing bloggers at SAP. And I said, hey, I love your content. Can I syndicate, can I repost some of your older stuff, some of your better stuff on our site, you know, and you'll get the exposure. And um, they loved it. They actually ended up, you know, sort of writing more and they started contributing original stuff. And and then what we found was that there was another group of people that were sort of envious of that group. And then they came to us and they said, hey, I'm interested in contributing. And then we got external people who were like not A-list influencers, but B and C-list influencers. And it was the same thing. We said, hey, we can't pay you. We'll use the platform to promote your personal brand. And then we had people coming to us and saying, hey, I love what you did for that guy. You built his brand. Can you help me build my?" And so we mm -hmm. ended up building, I call it a, a um, army of volunteer contributors. Yeah. So my trick and my point here is, is I don't think you can force it, but where there's an interest, and I end up becoming like, you know, almost a trainer in personal branding and blog writing. But I think where there's an interest, supply that training and that encouragement and that mentorship. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the best way. Where there's an interest and a desire, you yeah. can tap into that. Great, great, great tips. That was really insightful. I'm actually going to change my tactics. <laughs> 
I have two strategies for you. Yeah. Uh, one thing that works well if you have uh, access to a writer. Okay. A lot of people have the subject matter expertise, but they don't feel comfortable writing, or they just don't have good writing skills. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you probably don't even want them blogging, but they have great content in their heads. So mm -hmm. one good strategy for tapping into that is pairing up a writer with a subject matter expert and you get great content that's well written. Yeah. And, and that's one way to pull out some content that your employees uh, might not otherwise ever get out into the public. So that's one strategy. And another thought uh, for the content management, or, I'm sorry, the Content Marketing Institute uh, blog, I work with a lot of authors. And there are a lot of volunteers out there who have great knowledge, and none of them have much time. And it's mm. difficult to get people to give their time. So metrics can be very enticing. If you say to people, we have 133,000 subscribers, and our blog posts get an average of 1,700 shares, or whatever your stats are. Mm. That gets people's attention, and mm. they think, oh, maybe I can make some time for that kind of exposure. So that's mm. yet another strategy mm. and more motivation for you to build a subscriber base. It helps mm. to draw writers. It's great tips, great tips. We, we, do, you know, we do something very similar to like where you pair a writer, but we just follow the old interview format. So let's say we have like a client who's a lawyer who doesn't have time to write, but he has the subject matter and the experience. So we say, hey, can we have a five-minute call with you? And we just record it and then transcribe it and have a writer rework it. And now we've got content that, that they're going to love. So there's there's definitely really interesting ways to hack that process. And like you said, I thought that's a really good point. Some people are not comfortable with writing or feel that they don't have the time and there's, they have all the subject matter and you just have to find creative ways to pull it out of them where it doesn't feel like they're actually writing for you and pair it with someone who can sort of clean it up and, and present it properly on the blog. Wow, some, some great tips there. We, we are just doing a time check here. Um, I want to let people know who are watching this to be sure to be entering your questions um, either on Twitter with the hashtag of Marketing Fanatics or within see, the actual webinar. At the end of this, um, we are going to spend some leave a little bit of time at the end to make sure that we're, we're asking our marketing experts, our, our content marketing experts, those questions. So be sure to add them in. Let's move on to the um, the, the next question that I think that we have here, which is um, um, so this is a question a lot of people don't really know. And this again is a bit of a loaded question. You know, what are your normal visitor to lead conversion rates for so and big blog? I, you know, how about we just you know how about setting some expectations of you know telling us a story of experiences that you've worked on on other sites. How did content marketing start to become profitable for, for that business? And, and, and you know, where it was when you started out as being a nobody, and then over time, you know, where did it end up later on to set some sort of expectations for people about that? We kind of touched on this a bit before, but maybe we can hear a personal story from each of you of what happened in, in, your, in your life through content marketing. You want me to start? Yeah, you you spoke up first. You get it. <laughs> I'll um. So I I do have a pretty strong opinion on this. I I actually have never. I, I don't think I've ever even looked at uh, lead conversion rates from from content marketing efforts. And okay. and what I mean by that, is because I believe that the goal of content marketing is to, to attract an audience, engage and then convert them. That it's almost like um, you have to build the pool and before it spills over into the into in sort of something further downstream, mm -hmm. and so what I mean by that is you've got to start by reaching the right audience, um, and so you want to track that then trend that over time, and then you want to start making sure you're engaging them and you can look at social shares and and you can and then even subscribers a little bit as an engagement metric, um, and you want to build that pool right so you want to build your pool of engaged visitors, mm -hmm. then you want to build your pool of subscribed visitors right. So, so there is a, a, a percentage, but I, I think it's um, maybe like first-time visitor to subscriber. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't expect anyone to be a first-time visitor and then a subscriber. And, and if you do catch some, I think you're lucky. Uh, it's the repeat visitors, and it's that sort of experienced, um, you know, repeat visitor. Uh, and the customer experience that's going to drive subscriptions. And then with subscriptions and almost completely separate from maybe your content hub, you're going to do nurturing that's going to drive to leads, that's going to drive to something of value. So I would say, you know, build your pools and let them spill over into the next funnel stage, if you will. That would be my answer for, you know, what are some common conversion rates. Okay, cool. Stephanie, you want to go with this? 
Sure. So I, I think uh, what Michael says makes a lot of sense. I think you have to know um, your audience and you have to know kind of what your what your path is. So typically when we start out with something like this, we'll start out with, well, let's take a look at some of your conversion rates in other places for you and your company and your audience and then build our expectations based on that, right? So I know a common question is, how do I talk to my executives? They don't know anything about content marketing. How am I going to tell them this is worth investing in, especially if it's going to take three years? To, you know what I mean? Like that's that's not a message that executives want to hear. So you have to kind of, I think, start somewhere, right? So, so you know, start with your current website conversion and use that as a baseline, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that can be really helpful rather than just random, here's the B2B stat from maybe the CMI or something, right? Yeah. Um, but I think when you're asking for a story, um, you know, when uh, uh, we started a business blog for the Direct Marketing Association, right? So, um, so there was a lot of content about very specific areas. And so we would focus on those areas of, of importance to the industry, right? It's a trade association, so it was about um, public policy, and it was about um, you know uh, benchmarks, and it was about um, you know fame of, of certain individuals in the in the in the market, and there was best practices and things like that. So we had these kind of categories of content, um, and what we found is that the best content for us in terms of tracking that through to membership was really tracked based on the trends out in the world. So we would see huge amounts of traffic come in that um, were based on what was trending in the, in the news. So we knew we were on the right track when even a post from like three months ago was all of a sudden getting um, lots of, was the, was the transition page to the membership page because it had suddenly come back up in the news and because we were, you know, we were well um, optimized on search and stuff like that. So so I think it, was, it, it, it blew away all of our expectations and we didn't plan for that. We didn't plan to have long-term long content that way, right? And so that became a real measure for us was to make sure that we were tracking against what we thought were going to be future trends so that we would be prepared. So, you know, I think when you when you start to look at specifically for your own business, there's probably something like that that's going to come back and surprise you and delight you, hopefully, and you really take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. So, Great, great, great tips. Um, I do want to leave some time for the next uh, question as well, too. So we're going to keep moving forward. There's, there's two more questions I do want to get to. What, the next one is, you know, what's, what's a guaranteed way to make sure my content gets seen by the right audience? And, and I think really what I want to talk about here a little bit more is, is around, you know, pay, paid content, you know, content marketing through paid tools today. Are, are, are you guys using, uh, you know, uh, paid traffic to get more people to your content, you know, like native advertising, whether it's through Facebook or Twitter or Reddit? stumble upon, uh, you know, it goes on and on and on, you know, Yahoo has their own native advertising network as well as things like Brain, uh, you know, I uh, can't remember the name, Bra Outbrain and Tabuli and so forth like that. Are you really leveraging that with your content today to get it in front of the right audience? How, how are you getting the, you know, your content in front of the right audience? So I'll, I'll go ahead, Michael. Oh, I was just going to say, we've been, we've been testing the new LinkedIn stuff. Uh, the new advertising opportunities with them, and um, you know, Pulse always works really well for us in terms of you're, you know you're just promoting and amplifying what you have. So, um, so a couple of different um, customers have found that to be really interesting. And um, you know, it's I see stats all the time about content where it's like, um, you know, most business um, uh, content marketers, B two B content marketers, you know, say that LinkedIn is more their audience, but they're actually seeing more traffic from Facebook. I think part of that is because the Facebook tools for promoting your contact are actually or have been better. So now that LinkedIn has come out with a new series of advertising options, um, they've been they've been testing really well for us. And and I think what LinkedIn is trying to capitalize on is the fact that it's such a personal, career focused medium and channel. So content that speaks to that individual and helping that individual be successful in their current job or their next job. It's really resonating well, so it's early days for us in terms of testing that. But you know, we've had really good luck with the paid Facebook stuff, and now we're trying to transfer some of that over to LinkedIn and finding some early success. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I'll be really quick with my answer. I think the best way to get your content in front of the right audience is to create the stuff that they want. I think that's the simple answer to the direct question. Paid distribution. I love Andrew Davis. He taught me this quote that 50% of movie production uh, budgets are spent on distribution. So there's a 50-50 split. Most people don't realize that with yeah. blockbuster movies. And so I, you know, I've always believed in the, the power of paid distribution, but only behind 
stuff that you've tested. And so what I mean by that is don't promote crap because then you're just going to be pr promoting yourself as crap. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've seen a lot of success with brands that do a little bit of a short-term test. Twitter is actually great for showing you in a very short period of time what resonates with your audience and then putting paid promotion behind it um, on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. What's interesting, like Twitter promoted tweets doesn't drive traffic, but it drives audience. So it, you can increase your follower numbers, which then drives referral traffic from your from your built-in audience. So that's an interesting learning. Um, LinkedIn, I think, is doing some amazing things with lead accelerator and sponsor posts. Um, and then, you know, Facebook is, you know, sort of the gorilla, you know, the kind of 100-pound gorilla we all have to have to deal with. So, you know, boosting, I think, is important as well. Yeah, so Facebook, too, you can test your headlines real great using dark posts, um, which is a great way to kind of, if you're not quite sure if a headline's going to be better than another, it's a great way to kind of figure out what your audience might like over another. But, uh, uh, Marsha, do you have any insights on, on and, like, provide any tips around paid promotion for content? I am not going to speak to paid promotion, but to the original question, I just want to say one thing that I think is really important and super simple. Okay. The question, as it's worded, what's a guaranteed way to make sure my content gets seen by the right audience? Mm -hmm. Go where they are. Mm -hmm. Here's an example. My niece, she's a freshman in college. I visited her this summer, and she's on her phone on Instagram mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Where does she buy her clothes? She looks on Instagram, the store that's putting up all these pictures of the fashions that are at their store right now, she's got to get her, her fix and go buy her clothes from these guys. If that store were not on Instagram, they would not have her attention. So find out where your audience is already spending time and go there. Yeah. It seems obvious, but that's a really easy thing to, mi uh, to miss, I think. Don't put energy into pulling them to you. Go with them. Yeah. And I want to also remind everyone out there, print. We always think electronic, but print is a huge channel and it's making a comeback because you can get people's attention with print. It's, a, it's so noisy out there on the internet. And, and print is really something to keep in mind. Right. Good, good tips. Um, we're going to go to the next slide and I just want each of you to, you know, yell out your favorite uh, content marketing uh, paid tool and your favorite free one and then we're going to get right into some of the questions that are coming in. I want to make sure we have a chance to answer some of the questions out there that are being asked. So go ahead and shoot off your, your favorite paid and free tool and I'm going to start reading through some of these questions that we have. Go Stephanie. Oh, first, okay, so I would say paid. Um, my secret weapon that people are always surprised that I use is uh, the SlideShare Pro. I find that you know it's a huge resource for B2B marketers, and I, I find it astonishing that more people don't don't use that to um, to really help engage their audience. And it's it's really inexpensive, so it's almost a free tool. I'm going to put out there the one that I hope I'm going to love, which is Crazy Ed. I keep hearing about it. It looks super cool. It looks kind of like it produces heat maps of what people are paying attention to on your site, and I've been. Uh, working to get it going on my website and haven't quite got there yet, so I'm hoping I'm going to love that. You'll like As it. It's a, it's a good tool. It's a great one. Hotjar does it too, and it's cheaper, and uh, as well as in Google Analytics, you can run sort of a heat mapping for free as well too. That's where people are clicking on your content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great one. Michael? So obviously I represent a content marketing technology, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to have to say that one. I'm going to t so besides NewsCred, which is amazing, of course, uh, for paid, I'm going to go with Simple Reach um, and or Moz. So you got your SEO and your reporting there. For free, hands down, by far, I'm in every single day, BuzzSumo, no question. I, we love BuzzSumo. Great, great research tool. We've created a huge database of headlines just to swipe from using that tool. It's a great, great one. I, I give that one a thumbs up, too. Yep. So here's a couple of questions that have come in. Um, so I think this is a good one too that, that a lot of people struggle with and the question is what's your advice for content marketers who report to execs who don't believe content brings in qualified leads? Um, you know, that's a great question. How, how, how do we arm them with some things that they can say to prove that content marketing works? Yeah, I, I mean we have this exec question all the time and, and I faced it every day at SAP. Uh, my, my answer was always something to the effect of 
uh, you know, we sell we sell software. So when somebody goes to Google, they type in software. Do you want to be the first listing or do you want to not show up at all? And so content marketing is is partly about showing up and showing up in the early part of the buying process. Um, and so for me, I think it it was a light bulb moment for a lot of our sales team, um, senior folks who just didn't get the buyer journey. Right. I think I you have to speak their language and you have to speak data. You have to show them the data. If if you need to take a small uh, pilot project, so that you can have something to show, but it's numbers that are going to make the persuasion. Yeah, totally. I've we've got one more question here that I'll have time for, and then I, what I'd like to do is let people know if they stay right into the end, um, there will be a survey. It takes you two minutes to do, and if you fill out that survey, letting us know how you enjoyed the webinar, you'll be entered into a. A contest be able to possibly win a $50 uh, Amazon card, so please stick in. Here's the last question, uh, guys, that we got in here. It was about more around content for um, product-based e-commerce stores. It, it asked, how do you how do you find the sweet spot, or how do you promote something that that is you know the right balance between product content and and marketing content uh, if for your e-commerce store was the question. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with Ann Hanley's quote, make your customer the hero of the story, right? So you can still talk about your product. And the SAP, we used to say, we talk about what we do for our customers, not what we do. So talk, you can talk about what you do for your customers. You can if, infer there's a product and a customer relationship, but make them the hero. Tell, talk about how you saved somebody's job, you saved somebody a million dollars, you made them a rock star. Great. Now, guys, just before we go, I, I want to, as well to make it a chance for people to be able to get in touch with you if they want to know more about you. Um, could you uh, possibly just tell us, you know, at, real quick out there, if, if people want to get in touch with you, how would they do that? We'll start with you, Michael. You were talking last. Go ahead. How can they get in touch with you? Yeah, sure. So you can see there on the slide, um, at Brenner Michael is my Twitter handle, um, and you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or Facebook uh, or Twitter, and happy to, to talk to anybody. Stephanie, how about you? How, how do you like to get in touch? Uh, any way possible. I mean, the uh, uh, Twitter's here, and uh, you know, also very active on LinkedIn. And uh, you know, my email address is on every single one of my columns, so you're welcome to ping me anytime. Okay. And Marcia? What Michael and Stephanie said. Okay. And, <laughs> and if you need me, it's there too. It's Matthew. You can just go to PowerBySearch.com. Now, people are still out there. Uh, you know, Joel's probably going to open it up to the survey, so feel free to click on that survey right now and fill it out. Um, you know, we also want to let you guys know about the um, the upcoming webinar that's coming. So next month we have another webinar on August 27th. Um, you can register for this webinar at the Powered by Search. Uh, forward slash 2015 dash webinar dash series and it's all about local SEO. Um, it talks about the top local SEO ranking factors for 2015. We've got a great lineup that's coming there so we hope you will join us there as well. If you have any more questions out there, I'm sure our speakers are going to be checking on Twitter as well around the hashtag of marketing fanatics. Feel free to uh, tweet out your questions and we'll try and answer them as well too. And don't forget we will email you out a recording of this webinar if you didn't see it and it'll be able to view it as well on our blog in, in about a week. I want to thank our speakers today very much to you know Michael, to Stephanie and Marsha for coming. You guys dropped all kinds of amazing content tips and, and, and strategies today that I think people can take and implement into their business right away and start getting um, getting getting great results for their business. So thank you so much and uh, look forward to being in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.